could you address uh, the situation of the youth today and the difficulty that they have, parents they have with them with regards to raising them uh, Islamically in an un-Islamic environment mm -hmm. and what advice uh, could you give with the effects to that based on, you know, the, how the population has been dealt with the youth at this time and his companion. First and foremost Is that raising children Islamically Begins before the child is born It begins before the child is born Raising children in a quote unquote Islamic fashion It begins when a person looks for a spouse When a man looks for a wife when a woman looks for a husband, that's the first step of raising good Islamic children. What, who do you marry? What are you looking for? What is the integrity? What is the character of this man? What is the character and integrity of this woman? Where does she come from? What is her family like? How was she raised? Was she, did she go through any traumatic things in her life? Did she have a father, a mother, drug abuse? The list goes on of these problems and social ills. So try your best to select a wife or husband that's suitable Someone that's righteous Someone has to come from good stock As they say That's the first step Asking the law to give you A righteous, obedient wife Asking the law to give you A righteous, strong husband And the list goes on It's first Number two Is that A man is to make dua And a woman is to make dua For shaitan to protect them And protect their offspring There's a specific dua That a man makes Every time he's intimate with his wife for Allah to protect the child from the shaitan. The next step in raising a good child in Islam, this is in brief, not mentioning the proofs and evidences, this is in brief, is that you want to make sure that you nourish your wife and nourish your child with halal and not with haram. If you have a job in which you deal with riba or alcohol or the flesh of swine or this type of magazine or movie or this or that or lottery, gambling and these haram types of things, it's a problem. Feeding your family with haram has many adverse effects. It's going to hurt the woman. It's going to hurt the child through means you don't know. You're feeding them with bad things that are displeasing to Allah. It's going to have a metaphysical huh, backlash. The next step is when the child is born, you continue to make the offer it. You give the child a good Islamic name, a meaningful, symbolic name. A meaningful and symbolic name. And it's very unfortunate that we live today in which many people, they want to do away with the concept of symbolic names. And somebody says, well, it's not haram to have a non-Muslim name. I don't have to have an Arabic name or Arabian name. My name is Tim or John or Michael or this and that. Okay, we're not saying it's obligatory that you have to have an Arabic name. But what is more symbolic and meaningful? Abdullah, Abdul Wadud, or Jim and Tom and, and Dick. Honestly, this is reality. And many people, you know, I need not to go off the top, but this is very important about choosing the name for the child. When you join a gang or an order or you're part of a clique or this or that, you're an actor or a rapper or this and that, what's the first thing that they do or you do? Or you get a, a title, a nickname. No one calls you by your first name. They call them Cat or Blue or Hickey or Big Red or this or that. Everybody understand? This is the first thing. Is this not the case? It's not the case? It's the first thing. And no one knows your first name. And the proof is that they want to disrespect you. And when you leave the group, what's the first thing they do? They call you by your what? First name. Listen, Martin, or Michael, or Dennis, Kenneth, Derek. Uh -huh. They call you by your first name. And they disrespect you. So the concept of the name and it being what? Symbolic. Everybody understand this? The name is what? Symbolic. Let alone the concept of, and this is a little off topic, but it's very relative. Because we're not talking about, we're talking about people that call themselves imams and mashaykh. They want to be known by Western names. And I'm not saying this, that's haram, but it's a point. Is that you're easily attributed to jahiliyyah. When your name is known as Derek Fisher, I'm Imam Derek Fisher. That's my name. Everyone can trace me, follow me, and find me. Is this not the case? This person from Jailia High School, this one, sweetheart, flan, flan, all of you can follow you. Who, who wants that? Well, your name is Abu Aisha. 
You limit it amount that you limit the people that can what? Can follow you. I understand this. So the child deserves a good, wholesome Islamic name. Abdurrahman, Abdullah, Fatima Zahra, things like this. Everybody understand this? Then the child, you should slaughter for the child. Make the aqiqah. Shave the child's head. These are all from the rulings of the child. And to ask Allah's protection and refuge for the child. As is mentioned in the Quran. Then you continue to feed the child with halal. Then you raise the child. You teach them the basics of Islam. Even if they don't understand. Bring them to the master when they're young like that. Have your son mimic you in the salat. Jump up and down. Shake and dance in the salat. It's, he learns how to pray eventually. He's accustomed to the masjid. He knows men sit here, women sit there. When you see a brother, you shake his hand, you look him in the face. It has an effect upon the child. It has an effect upon the child. And then when the child becomes five years old, six years old, seven years old, you put an overgarment on your daughter. Oh, she's young. Don't be harsh. Don't be extreme. Her body's not developed. Are you sick? What's wrong with you? No one's looking at a little girl. These characteristics are instilled in a child at a young age. You do not force hijab upon your daughter when she's 15 or 16. You wear the hijab when she's 7, 8, and 9. And she doesn't feel uncomfortable leaving the house unless she's covered in a certain way. You instill courageousness and chivalry in a boy at a young age. Son, go, 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 go bring me this. I dare you to go get this. Go grab this and come back. You have your son, a little toy sword. Look, you instill in him manhood, men, a rough, tough, rugged. You understand these things? At a young age. And then as they grow older, you teach them more. You give them the mandatory acts of salah, of hijab, of tahara. This is haram, that's unlawful. Good Muslim friends. And most importantly is thorough Islamic education. It's thorough Islamic education to the best of your ability. Now you may ask the question, why well, yeah, are you giving us this long lecture? And it's not the question. We're talking about children that are alive today. Children that are what? Alive today and big and grown. We say before we get to this, we have to start what? Yeah. With this. We have to start the hustle and then what? Work our way up. If your child is alive today, and he's 16, 17, 18, 15, 12, I'm not trying to make anybody despair or lose hope. But a bitter, harsh reality is that a big part of the battle was already what? It was already lost, unfortunately. Don't give up. A lot is left to be done, but a big part of it is what? It's already going. 12 years old, 13 years old, a child is starting to form his or her own personality. Everybody understand this? So what can you do? Obviously, you have to humble yourself. If you neglected your child for these years, you didn't pray yourself. You sold alcohol yourself. You drunk alcohol yourself. You yourself don't wear hijab. How do you expect your daughter to wear hijab? So when you become enlightened, you receive the guidance, you learn what's correct, you have to be gentle with your children. And this is one of the most common things we see in Queens, New York. A lot of brothers, wherever they come from, they lived upon quote-unquote jahiliyyah. They came to New York, they learned about the Sunnah, they learned about this Dawah, Fulan, Fulan, they grow their beards, they cover up, they practice, but their wives and their children are still what? They're still stuck in the Caribbean. Their wives and their children are still stuck back then. And they're like, look, just because you have a big beard and you wouldn't be all super duper religious, that don't mean I want to live like that. That's unfortunate. And a lot of times it comes from the brothers being too harsh and too hasty. You have to gently bring them in. Kindly bring them in. The same applies to your child. Don't just restrict your child and lock them down and beat them. Go to the masjid. Let's go to the masjid, son. It's a basketball game at the masjid. It's a lecture at the masjid. It's a dinner at the masjid. It's other youths there at the masjid. Everybody understand this? You have to gently Islamify them. You have to do what? Gently, gradually, progressively what? Islam Islamification. Everybody understand this? It's very important. And that's right. I understand this? You have to Islamify them. You have to. But gently. Another concept or piece of advice is that if your child wants to do good, wants to be righteous and pious, you shouldn't try to hold your child back, as some parents do, unfortunately. If your child wants to memorize the Quran and study Islam, let them study Islam. No, but you have to be a doctor too. And you have to be an engineer too. Why? Why? Why would you take a thoroughbred horse and tie up its legs? Let the horse gallop. That's what it's made to do. And our children don't want to be as pious and study Islam and, and be righteous and enmeshed it. Let your child practice Islam. You think your risk comes to you because of your degree or your job? You think because you're an engineer or a physician or you work for the sanitation or you work at this place, Omar, you think you make your money for yourself? Allah gives you that risk. Allah gives you that risk. So don't hold your child back. So in brief, 
having good company around your child is very important. You have to have good friends. If your daughter is around girls that curse and swear and are sassy and fussy and too fresh, that's how she's going to be. If your daughter is around girls that are shy, clean, and noble, respectable, that's how she's going to be. If your son is around people that smoke and talk about this rapper and this person and this girl and this picture on the phone, wallahi, we've sat in the masjid several times. Alhamdulillah, one of the brothers, Alhamdulillah, he made a total turnaround. He comes to the match and he prays. There was one day in Ramadan in Queens, New York, I was eating iftar. And there was a bunch of young guys in the match, 12 years old, 13 years old. They were young, no older than 14 years old. They were laughing and joking and passing around a phone with pornographic pictures on it in the match. And iftar. I swear, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. They were laughing. Oh, check it out. Right next to me. And they didn't know that I, I was paying attention to them. And I told them, I said, listen, guys, you know, this is not cool. You can't do that, especially in this place. That's not right. So they put up the phone, alhamdulillah, many of those brothers, well, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I know two of them. They come to the match in 109. I'm going to say who they are. They, alhamdulillah, started walking straight. The point is, is that, do you think all of them wanted to look at those pictures? No, but company. Tuyur and Natur al Ashkaniha. Taqa. It says, birds of a feather, what? Flock together. Character is a thief. Everybody understand this? If you're rolling with a wah, then your friend is one, then you are too. Everybody understand this? <laughs> you put in whatever word you want to put it in the dots. Everybody understand this? So the company that you keep with your children is very important. And you can't be laxed, but you can't be overly, ex excessively harsh. It has a balance. It's a what? It's a balance. And if you've wasted years, then you have to be even more what? De delicate, soft. Not, not diligent. Nah, you have to be softer. Because now he's going to feel that you're boxing him in now. And you're forcing him to go to the match. You're not, uh, you got to be gentle. You got to be what? Gentle but firm. But you can't. It's not the same no more. The clay is, is already molded. The clay is dry. The semen is what? When the semen is wet and fresh, you can write in it. You leave a footprint and it's easy. It's, it's, not, it's not the same anymore. So therefore, these are some general pieces of advice. Dua to Allah, first and foremost, as we said. Feeding the child with the halal. Putting a child in an Islamic environment to the best of your ability. Islamic education. Islamic identity. If you go to public school, know that you are a Muslim son. When you have people on your block that you play with, know that you're what? A Muslim. You're not the same. You're different. I'm sorry. Whether you like or not, you're different than them. You're special. You have to instill this in them. You have an Islamic what? Personality. The name, clothes, prayer, how you talk, how you walk is a part of the Islamic personality. But well, how can you do this if you yourself have a weak Islamic personality? Everybody understand this? It's a problem now. When you're afraid of people knowing your true name, Ahmed. When you're afraid of looking like a Muslim. When you're afraid of going to the masjid in the daytime. When you're afraid, it's a problem. Everybody understand this? It's very important, brothers and sisters. So this is a brief shake. Obviously, a topic like this needs an entire series of lectures. And one of that, how we've done what? We've done series on this on HadithDisciple.com. We spoke on Tarabi Islamia. We've done lectures on raising children, khutbas on raising children. All of it can be found on hadithdisciple.com in abundance. Walillahi alhamd. Next question says, They say, if you see our Prophet Sallallahu in his in our dream, shaitan cannot be him. Uh, is that true for Hazrat Isa, perhaps, alayhi salam, or any other Prophet? Tayyip. We say that the Prophet Sallallahu has told us in the authentic narration in Bukhari and Muslim, those who see me in a dream have truly seen me. For indeed the shaitan cannot what? Huh? Cannot take my form. And there are other narrations that say that he will see me. And there are different interpretations on what that means. What's important is that the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't say it by any other prophet or messenger. So we don't know. And we stop with the text. If he said, the shaitan cannot resemble me, then we say, the shaitan does not take the form of Muhammad Is it possible for the prophets to receive this as well? Of course, Allah has power to do all things. Is it a means of disrespect? Shaitan playing around, taking the figure of other people perhaps? But we don't know specifically. So we say, is that Muhammad said that about himself, We don't know about the other prophets and messengers. perhaps. But we don't know. This is from the affairs of the unseen. In which there is no reasoning. There's no what? There's no human reasoning when it comes to ghaib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Next question says, What does it mean if you have... 
if you see Mahdi alayhi salam in your dream if you see the Mahdi in your dream perhaps it's a question we say first and foremost is even when it comes to seeing the Prophet say something in the dream the first thing is you have to make sure that you actually saw the Prophet and there are many people who have a misunderstanding of what the Prophet looked like what was the Prophet said something's physical features what were the Prophet said something's moral features you see the Prophet in a dream saying or doing something that's unfitting you didn't see the Prophet you see the process of a dream, but you don't know his actual physical description. You didn't know what? You think, you thought that you saw him, but you actually what? You didn't see him. And the same applies to the Mahdi, alayhi salam. What does the Mahdi look like mentioned in these hadiths? Do we have a total description of him? Or do we have some similar descriptions of him? He would look like me. His nose would be like this. He would come from this place, from this tribe. These general things like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what the Mahdi looks like specifically. And secondly, if you see the Mahdi in your dream, if that is the Mahdi, perhaps it's a good sign. But there is no legislative ruling that is taken from that type of dream. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best what the Mahdi looks like specifically. Allahu alam. Fall down the feast. Uh, question from online. Uh, if a woman gets her menses after Zohar came in, does she have to make up Zohar? And after one of her Question also says. If she, also, if she, also, if she gets it when Mother comes in too with Isha, Mother will be. If a woman gets her menses after Zuhur comes in? Or before Zuhur comes in? Her menses after Zuhur comes in. Before it goes out? Before Zuhur is out? It's not specified. If a woman gets her menses after Zuhur comes in, does she, ha Sorry. Does she make up Zuhur and Asur? The question says, if a woman gets her menses after Zuhur has come in, I would say that which is apparent from the question is that there was still time remaining from... From what? Zuhur. From Zuhur. That was That's apparent from the question. Not necessarily, but that was what? That's thought from the question. Is that it came in after Zuhur, and there was still time, what? To pray. Hey, wow. So therefore, once it's time for Salat al she must pray. She sits around, she makes wudu, she's traveling, whatever the case may be. She gets her menses, she must make up Salat al without any doubt. As far as Salat al-Asr, then the view of some of the fuqaha is that she must make Salat al-Asr. But the view that seems to be most correct and most sound is that she does not have to make up Salat al-Asr. And that is because she was not in a pure state when Asr came in. لَمْ تَكُنْ مِنْ أَحْلَ الْخِطَابِ عَنَا ذَاكِ وَمِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ مَنْ اشْتَرَتَ ذَلِكُ وَأَلْزَمَ أَحْبِ ذَلِكُ هَذَا هُوَ الْأَحْوَطِ That's the safest view to make up Zuhur al-Asr. As far as strength of the madhab, of the view, the opinion, that which is most apparent is that she only has to make up Salat al-Zuhur. And the same applies to Salat al-Maghrib. Her menses come on after Maghrib came in. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour. She was pure. Then the menses came. She shouldn't have delayed the salat, but let's say, hypothetically, she has to make up salat till Maghrib. And then she has a menses for five more days, six more days. Do we say that she has to make up that Isha prayer? We say no. But many of the ulama say that she does. They say that she does because Dhuhr and Asr are prayers that are made what? Together, occasionally. So that's the safest, but not necessarily the most strong. And this is in brief. Wallahu ta'ala alam is a long argument on that issue among the traditional schools of thought. Uh, what is the best book on Islamic history to teach children from? The best book to teach Islamic history on English to children? I would say, in my humble opinion, the books that are made by Dar Salaam. The books that are made, the series that are made by what? Dar Salaam. And they have extensive books on history, on Sirah, on the battles. They have the Islamic School series. In English, that's my humble opinion with the best source. Wallahu alam. Uh, what is the authentic uh, way the Prophet looked if you see him in a dream? Question says, what did the Prophet ﷺ look like? We say in general, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ wasn't extremely tall nor extremely short. The Prophet ﷺ was not extremely fair-skinned, nor was he extremely dark-skinned. The Prophet ﷺ his hair wasn't too curly, nor was it too straight. The Prophet ﷺ is said to have large hands. He's said to have a relatively large forehead. In some narrations, his face was extremely handsome, looking like the moon. Everybody understand this? This is a general description that we know about the Rasul al-Kirim As for the other specifics and things like this, the Prophet he didn't have gray hair. He died, he only had a few gray hair in his, in his, in his head and his beard. 
Okay, and things like this. So, we say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi here, sometimes said he went to his, his earlobes, and sometimes a little bit towards his shoulders. It wasn't too long, it wasn't too short. Everybody understand this? At the end of the day, these are some of the general descriptions of the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. Of the what? Of the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. We say what? Before we, before we move on to this question, we say what? Is that what? Before we move on to the next question, is that if you see these things in the dream, along with the other authentic descriptions of the Rasul al Karim alayhi salatu wasalam, and in his character, then perhaps you've seen the Nabi al Karim. And inshallah is a means of glad tidings. However, what do you do when you're awake and when you're up? As the Prophet said, in the hadith of Abu Huraira and Jam, every member to the he says that towards the end of time, the believer's dream will be sharp, extremely accurate. Very seldom will the dream will the believer's dream be wrong with the interpretation of it. He says, He says, in the most those who have the most truthful dreams are those who are the most truthful when they're awake. So how do you live? Do you follow the Sunnah when you're alive? Do you practice Muhammad's way when you're awake, walking and talking? That's yeah, going to have an effect on how you, or if you see him in a dream. There's some Muslims, unfortunately, they have illusions of grandeur, without a doubt. They're far from the deen, far from the sunnah. And he says, I saw the Nabi al Kareem. Well, one brother told me in New Jersey, huh? He told me, he walked up to me, he said, I saw the Nabi al Kareem in my dream. He came over to my house, he ate lunch with me. He sat with me, he drank my tea, well, I. He ate my food, he sat down. He took both my hands, he grabbed my hands, his knees were with my knees, he looked at me, and he told me this and he told me that. Wallahi. And then he says, Mufti, can you lead my Hajj group next year in Medina? So he said. At the end of the day, yani, a Muslim is far from the Sunnah, but yet and still, he's going to be honored with having this magnificent dream about the Nabi al-Kareem. So detailed, so beautiful. Yani. Everybody see the point we're trying to get to? Wallahu ta'ala However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to do all things. Also, uh, for further benefit, we have done uh, a brief series on dream interpretation from Sahih al-Bukhari on HadithDisciple.com in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Next question says, what is the condition of the hijab for the Salat to be accepted? Were many of the narrations about the Mahdi fabricated? First question says, what are the conditions of the hijab for the Salat to be accepted? First and foremost, we have to fix the, the, the question. And that is, no one knows what is accepted or rejected. We don't know what is accepted by Allah. Right. We know what is valid and what is invalid. Huh? What Allah and His Rasul made as signs and indicators for what is sahih and what is facet. As for that which is accepted, that's something only Ar Rahman knows of. إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah only accepts from the Muttaqeen. Who are the Muttaqeen? Are you from the Muttaqeen? Can I say I'm from the Muttaqeen? Everybody understand this? So acceptance of ibadah is a virtue from Allah. The ibadah being permissive, being valid, being correct. Inshallah, you can study and learn that. From fiqh, from Sunnah Nabi Dawood, from Bukhari. But you don't know what is accepted or rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps a person can do something in a correct manner and he may have pride or conceit. He may scorn his Muslim brother. A brother may, may pray, make the prayer the proper way. He's racist. He's prejudiced. I hate people from Yemen. They're disgusting, filthy people. And he's praying next to someone who's from Yemen. <coughs> Allah may not accept his ibadah because of that. Mm. Everybody understand this? Even though he did everything else. We love the people of Yemen. <laughs> that was just an example. Everybody understand this? Alhamdulillah, I lived in Yemen. <laughs> So therefore, there could be something which could prevent somebody from having their, their ibadah accepted. Even though they did everything correctly. Such as pride. Such as conceit. Such as looking down upon people thinking that, oh, my ibadah is what? I'm doing a law of favor. I'm what? And many people, they say this. Not with their tongues, but with their what? The actions. They look at, they're like, we're doing the deen a favor. We're doing a, a favor to the sunnah. La, la, la. It's not like that. So only Allah knows what is accepted. As far as what is valid, then we say when a woman is of age, then everything should be covered from her hairline around the oval of her face. Should be covered. Her entire body, 
from her head, her neck, her back, her chest, her belly, abdomen, legs, all the way to the top of the feet. All the way to the top of the feet. This is what should be covered in the Salah. And it's not enough just to be covered, but it should also be loose. It is invalid for a Muslim woman to pray and she has on tight-fitting clothes. Just as it is unlawful for a woman to go outside her home wearing tight-fitting clothes. She has to have her skin covered and it must be what? Loose. It cannot be tight. It cannot be fitting. It cannot be something that clearly resembles clothing of men. It was clearly from the exclusive clothing of men or the wardrobe of men. It can't be something that clearly resembles the clothing of wicked people, etc. So the body must be covered with exclusion to the hands, the face, and the bottom of the feet. Hands, face, and bottom of the feet are allowed to be exposed in the salah. Everything else should be covered in the salah. And inshallah, that will be valid. As far as it accepted, that's something that you have to ask a Rahman for. Oh Allah, Allahumma taqabbal minni. Accept this from me. Only Allah knows that. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next question says, Were there many of the narrations of about the Mahdi fabricated? Yes, there are. Just like there are many other narrations that are fabricated. And yani, we, hopefully we'll have another time in which we can explain this. The concept of fabrication in Islam. Spurious hadith. Why? Who? When? How did these hadith come about? And there are many different aspects, Kwame, that many people love to fabricate about. Such as Surah Yasin. Very strange. How many hadith you find on Surah Yasin. It's amazing. How many Muslims are just stuck and amazed on this one surah? Not Baqarah, not Ali Imran, not even Surah Al Rahman. This is not always what? Yasin. I asked one of my teachers this in Medina, one of my personal mashaykh. Well, he was baffled. He says, Good question, Sheikh Muhammad. He said, I don't know. He says, But you're right. There's so many different weak fabricated hadith on Surah Yasin. He says, I have no idea. It's a good question. And we drunk tea. Everybody understand this? <laughs> so the point I'm trying to get to is there are certain things that certain people love to talk about and from those things fabricated narrations about the what? The Mahdi as well. Wallahu alam. And there are many authentic hadith on the Mahdi and there are some people who say that they are Muslims who reject and deny the hadith on the Mahdi and that's misguidance. Wallahu alam. Next question says What is the relevance of recording hadith that are known to be fabricated? We said there are many points of relevance. First and foremost is to know what's going on. Mm. To know what's going on. I want to write down the weak stuff. That way no one can bring it. No one can't bring it and try to con and lie to the people and say it's authentic. Because it's all recorded. It's documented. It's classified. It's categorized. We have a what? A register. Everybody understands a what? A register. They take your fingerprint. Fingerprint of a criminal. The way he can't what? Act like he's someone who isn't a criminal. Because we have it what? On record, on file, oh, when you were locked up, when you got home, what, you were, what your crimes were, you record them. So you can distinguish between those people who are criminals and those people who aren't criminals, law abiding citizens. So the same applies to the Sunnah. The Ulama of Hadith, they wrote down fabricated narrations to keep a register, to keep it in track, to keep it in check. And they also wrote down fabricated Hadith because they were specialists. And a specialist is someone who knows everything about huh, the petroleum jelly, the Vaseline. Huh? Keep your hands huh, moisturized. He says, what? They specialists, they wrote down everything. A specialist knows everything about his science, his field. The ins and the outs, the good and the bad, the virtues and the vices. Because he's a specialist. So there's many relevant points on writing down, recording, even reporting fabricated hadith. Nah, and that's in brief. Any other questions from the brothers or the sisters before we stop? Follow Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum. How can the brothers rectify their affairs with their wives? Some brothers may have been married a year, six months, ten years, fifteen years, and the brother, the brother tells the sister to do a certain thing which is in the confines of the sunnah, but they rebelled and they say, well, you've always done this to me. How do we rectify our affairs? Because the Messenger of Allah has said that you can do well by a woman for many things. And then you do one thing wrong. And she says, you've never. Okay. Yes. We say first and foremost, we have general principles and then we have specific concepts. The general principle is the nature of man and the nature of a woman. Man, in general, is hasty. 
hasty, greedy, aggressive, oppressive by nature. But that doesn't mean that every single man is like that. A woman by nature is emotional. Everybody understand this? Softer, more caring, more this, more that. But it doesn't mean that every single woman is like that. It doesn't mean what? Every single woman is like that. Many women, I'm not saying all women, or just say some women, okay? Many of them, they often forget the good treatment that a man gives them for years. And this is known among all religions, faiths, and colors, and races. One mistake, one thing you do wrong, I ask for this, you've never done nothing to me. You've never done nothing for me. I'm sure every brother can raise their hand. They've heard this at least once. You never help me out. You never take the kids. You never take me out nowhere. You never have any romance. You never this, you never, you never. It happens all of the time. Does a woman forget? Does a woman neglect? Do her emotions and her love for her husband take over what is authentically reported? Only Allah knows. But not every single woman is like that. But in general, the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, He says, and if a man treated his wife kindly their entire life, and he made one slip, one mistake, one fall, she would say, you never did anything for me. I never saw any good from you. Not every single woman is like this, but this is the general nature of what? Uh, in general. So therefore, man, he has his mistakes. A woman, she has her mistakes. So living together, living in harmony, Allah the Exalted He says, وَلَا تَنْسَوْا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah says, and do not forget the virtue that you have among each other. Indeed, Allah sees and knows all that you do. This is a tremendous verse in the Quran. And it's very unfortunate that it isn't mentioned too much during the counseling sessions. Taqillah, this is the rights of the wife. Sheikh Fulan says this. Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَوْا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Do not forget the virtue that you have among each other. In other words, sister, don't forget all of the good things that your husband did for you. Don't forget when he was there for you, when he took care of you. Don't forget about your secrets and your flaws and your mistakes that he never told anyone of. Don't forget about the love that he gave you, the support that he gave you, the safety that he gave you. Don't forget if he makes a mistake, if he makes an error, if you change, if you go through this, don't forget the virtue. And the same applies to the woman. Yaki, this woman was with you from day one when you had nothing. She was with you when you came home from jail. She was with you when you went overseas. She was with you when you graduated from school and you had nothing. And you and her used to live in a studio. Huh? One room, shared kitchen with the neighbors. She was with you. She was patient upon rodents and, huh? She was with you when the roof was leaking. She was with you when everyone else betrayed you. She stood in your corner, defended your honor. She gave birth to your children. She raised them. She looked after your wealth, your honor. She kept your bed clean. When you travel, when you had to go here and go there, she was with you for all those years. She gave you her youth, her beauty, her body. She submitted herself to you. And now she makes a mistake. She goes wrong. She says something, something happens to her, and you don't want to be with her no more. Everybody understand this? That's wrong. So it applies to both sexes. Allah says, do not forget the virtue that you have among each other. For each other, let alone the fact that Allah knows what you're doing. Allah sees you. So therefore, that's my advice. Sisters, don't think about the bad, think about the good. Brothers, don't look down upon the negativity, look at the positivity. As the Prophet says, La yafruk mu'minun mu'mina. He says, a believing man should never hate a believing woman. He should never detest a believing woman. Huh? minha khasla minha ukhra. He says, if he's displeased with one thing, then he'd be pleased with another. And the same applies. So this is my advice, is that just think about the virtue, think about the loyalty. I mean, all of the struggles that your husband went through for your comfort. Regardless whether he did them right or wrong, successful or unsuccessful, but the fact is that he actually went out and broke his back for your comfort. How can you throw it down a drain because of this and because of that? 10, 15 years of marriage, kids, how can you throw it down a drain? Everybody understand this? So that's my advice for both of them to look at the hasanat that they have, the good times, and reflect on that. And hopefully that positive energy will what? Correct those errors. Bidden in life's final with Allah. Fado. What's a good translation for Al-Muwatta if there is A good translation for Muwatta if there is one? Me personally, the different translations that I've seen, two or three of them, all of them were similar. They were fair. 
I didn't see anything that was terrible or outlandishly wrong with the translations that I came upon. From the ones that I've seen in the market and that are available, I didn't see any of them that were terrible, that were really bad. And Charlotte they're all similar. But of course, there's nothing I read in the original Arabic text. Wallahu alam. Thank you so much. You as well.